Hi, welcome to On The Fly, your source for local fly fishing information. I'm your host, Lee Smith. We're here at the end of March. Mother Nature has dealt us one more round of snow, and we're here at the Angler's Den in Pauling, New York. We're about to go inside and uh, see what, uh, what they have going on for their annual jamboree, which marks the uh, beginning of the fishing season here in New York State. Let's see how they're doing. I'm here today with Tom Zarecki, owner of the Angler's Den and, and the sponsor of today's Jamboree. Tom, thanks for, hey, for allowing us to, to interview you. Absolutely. Um, I have to admit, though, when I, when I think about fly fishing, I think of you know, Patagonia, Montana, maybe the Smokies, or maybe even some of the rivers in the Northeast. Pauling isn't on the, the, the top of my, my list. Can, can you tell me a little bit about why Pauling and the history of the Angler's Den? Well, absolutely. Uh, pa uh, Angler's Den was... Uh, We'll put, put together uh, in early 2000s, and we chose Pauling uh, because it's always been home for us, and we wanted to have that uh, family feel and authentic fly shop. And so it's, um, it's a real great niche here in Pauling because we're not um, stuck or a destination shop on one specific river. We cater to um, a plethora of rivers um, across the Northeast. We, we border Connecticut, so we have opportunities um, on the Housatonic, the Farmington River, the Ten Mile, and then um, in New York we have uh, the Westchester area, the Croton Watershed. We have the Catskills an hour north of us, and um, and there are just so many lakes and ponds and areas to um, to get out there and do fly fishing that uh, I thought it was, we thought it was a great place to uh, to start. Yeah, it's, that's that's great, and you're right. There's a lot of really good water not too far from here. Um, I notice as we're, we're sitting here today, we're, we're actually in a, a, a bank vault. I mean, I've got safety deposit boxes over here. I've got safes over here. Um, I've got to imagine that's unusual for just about any, any fly shop. Can you give me a little history about this, this building? Well, certainly. This, uh, this was the orig one of the first original buildings in the uh, historic village of Pauling. Um, it's been around since the turn of the century. Uh, the bank fixtures have been installed here since the mid-40s. And the, um, and the bank had moved locations, um, and we kind of found our, our spot in here, and uh, it's, been a, it's, it's been great. We have uh, our, our common um, tagline is our flies and equipment are so great you can bank on it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. Tell me a little bit about the types of clients that come in here, because I've got to imagine being between the city and the Catskills, you, you get a variety, at least I would think. Absolutely. Um, we cater to all uh, walks of life here. We have uh, the, 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 uh, the, the guys at the top of the spectrum, the guys, uh, the blue collar guys working in the, uh, you know, in the mines. And uh, everybody gets together on the, uh, on the river and uh, it, it's the camaraderie really what makes it worth it. Um, it makes it worth it for us to work out of the shop and um, to see everybody get along, to really enjoy nature and uh, unplug and, and really um, and figure out what's real out there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great time for everybody. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the shop itself, a little um, as far as the services you offer and the types of equipment and that type of thing. Well, that's a great question. Um, we get that question a lot. Um, we do a lot of, most of our business, we have a full uh, stocked fly shop with um, all the equipment and material to tie your own flies and, and get into the sport. Um, and we also do a great uh, services with um, guided trips, um, classes for fly tying. Mm -hmm. So some of the guided trips, we do a half day and full day uh, wade and uh, float trips on uh, local rivers, the Catskill region, the Housatonic, uh, the Ten Mile River, so we have um, a, a variety of different packages for um, to, to to meet everybody's uh, needs. Right. You know, and for those who aren't familiar with the area, tell tell me a little bit about the types of fish that you catch on these trips. Okay, we have um, we most of the fish that we target are, are trout. We have rainbow uh, brown trout and uh, the occasional brook trout thrown into the picture, which is always a bonus. There's a uh, smallmouth and largemouth bass that are and and lots of uh, uh, panfish, you know, that keep us occupied, mm -hmm. and it, it's great for guys that are, are and um, kids that are getting into the sport. We can take them out to the river, and we can get you hooked up pretty quickly with a fly rod, and um, and then then it starts. You know, after your first your first uh, fish on the fly rod, you're you're hooked. Great. Yeah. Right. So for, for the folks at home, what's the best way to get in touch with you and, and the Angler's Den? Great. Well, that's easy. Uh, log on to anglersden.net. 
and um, you can see our phone number um, or address and um, you know our email address is flyfish at anglersden.net and our phone number is 845-855-5182 and, um, and you most likely you'll get in touch with me or my father or Frank and uh, we'll get you out there as soon as possible. That sounds, that sounds Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Tom, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate no it. That's Tom Zarecki from the Angler's Den. That's great. So tell me a little bit about what you're Certainly. going to tie today and, and if you mm -hmm. will kind of walk us through it as you go. Yeah, absolutely. What I'm going to tie for you is a variation of what we call a Hendrickson, which is a mayfly. Um, there's different insects that come off in our waters. Uh, the most popular is probably the mayflies. And uh, the very first major hatch we have is the Hendrickson hatch, which starts early May, you know, first couple of weeks of May. Um, so we're trying to prepare for it now. Um, it's a the first, like I said, the first major hatch and the trout start to feed off the surface, which okay. is a lot of fun. They call that dry fly fishing. Um, so you visually, it's a visual game. You can see the flies on the surface as they come and you're trying to mimic what the naturals look like. And you can watch the trout rising and, and feeding off the surface. So I'm going to show, uh, show you how to tie what we call a parachute Hendrickson. Parachute yeah, and I'll explain okay. the whole process as I go and the materials used. Great. So, okay. I mean, put my glasses on. Let's see what we're doing here, but... All right. Um, this is a size 12 hook, and there's all different size hooks involved in this, and they're all numerical. The uh, the lower the number, like eights or tens, the larger. The smaller, uh, like a 20, is a very tiny hook. Uh, a size eight or six would be a very large fly. 12 is um, about the size of the Hendrickson, 12s and 14s. Okay. okay, so a mayfly has, a mayfall done, has a tail. And here we're using some rooster uh, barbels, as you can see here, right? That's from rooster. What we're going to do is we're going to take off a bunch of them like this. You know, it it's really comes down to just the feel thing. Um, here, maybe about eight strips of it. I'm going to strip it like that, make sure it's lined up, and you can see, you can see it looks like a little paintbrush almost. Okay. See that? And it's going to be the tail is going to be the length of the body, all right? And okay. the body is going to be that, that bar right there, right? That's the hook, the whole length of the hook. So everything in tying is proportion. The tail, the body, the wing, the legs, they all have to be around the same size. That's the way nature works on, on these insects, so they float real good down the water. So we're going to just measure it up against here and tie it right in with the thread. A couple of turns like that. It's pretty simple. Put it right back there, and there you go. So as you can see, those rooster hackles, which are kind of stiff, and they're gonna help the fly uh, float on the water. Okay. So again, this is a dry fly, so it's gonna be on the surface. And um, you can see what I did there. Just tied it right back in. Okay. Now, the next thing we have to create is the body of the fly. And there's many different ways we can do that. We can use dubbing, which is, this is a synthetic, a man-made product. Um, you could use hare's ear or possum, which are natural. So there's many different options that we have to tie bodies, but what I like to use is what we call a turkey biot. Okay. All right, that's from a turkey tail. And the biot is, comes from the shorter side here. And you can see it's just, uh, Little stem like this. Okay. All right. There's a clear side and a dark side on it, and depending on how I tie it in, I can get a smooth body, or like a rough body. Okay. And for the mayfly, we want to get a smooth body, so we're going to take it and we're going to tie it in, so the little notch there is facing the tail. I know it's a lot of, you know, technicalities that, uh -huh. that people may not understand, but uh, it's clear here and a little bit darker here. Okay. Okay. So we're going to take that. And Moisten a little bit, tighten at the tip, like that. Okay, see? So now that notch is facing this way. Gotcha. And with my thread, I use a lot of thread when I tie because it's relatively cheap material, mm -hmm. and it makes a very good foundation to put my natural materials on top of. Okay. All right, and the shape of a mayfly is thinner in the back, and as it goes forward towards what they call the thorax, of the fly, it's thicker. So I can get that shape by using my thread. 
I'm just trying to take a few seconds to build the shape of the body here like this. Okay. Just like that. Okay, that's about right. It's like a sh cigar shape almost, if mm -hmm. you could see. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're building it up like yeah, the body of build, an insect. Right, tree. building it up and using my thread. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is these are my hackle pliers. We'll clip all different tools that we use in fly tying, but okay. I'm going to take this. this to make the body. And you're wrapping that around. And I'm going to wrap mm -hmm. it around. So this is the turkey. And this makes a nice smooth body. And if you look closely, it adds like little segmentations. You could see a little lighter and darker kind of effect. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why earlier I was describing that one side is darker, one side is lighter. And the reason why this is a great material to use for bodies on mayflies is because if you look at the body of a natural mayfly, it has that effect. It has, those it has the segmentation in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, uh, again, finding the right materials to create the, as close to the effect of the natural as you could possibly get. So, so far we have the tail, which is the same length as the body. We created a nice natural looking body. Um, the next thing we have to do is make a wing. Um, Again, these mayflies, which start off as larvae under the water, but uh, when, when they emerge, they become adults, and they, they have wings. And they're actually very elegant uh, flies. Um, and their wings are what they call a dun color. So it's like a slate gray, like this. Okay, okay? this is a synthetic man-made material. Again, there's so many different materials you can mm -hmm. use, and this is just what I find to be very easy for me to, uh, to use and to manipulate. So I'm going to take a little bit here. Okay. Don't need much. You can see. Take it out like this. About that much. Cut it. Okay. And now, what takes a little bit of practice is just knowing. You can see you kind of make a mess. My wife usually says, well, you make sure you clean up yourself there because there's feathers and sure. things all over the place. But with my fingers, I just kind of pull out the fibers until I get the thickness that I want. And that, again, takes a, you know, just some practice. That's about right right there. So I'm going to moisten it again. And I'm going to tie that in. And I'm going to take it. And I'm going to figure eight between the two sections like this. You see that? Yes. Yeah, right, so look right. like wings. Yeah, it looks like wings, right? But I want to post this. And what it means by post is because the mayfly wings are upright, we're going to take them, their fingers like this. We're going to pull it up like that. And then we are going to take our thread and put a little base of, of thread on the bottom here. And that's to keep those wings up. Up, so that, exactly up. right. That's exactly right. We call posting it. So I'm just taking the thread. And you've got to put some decent amount of turns in there. So yeah, just keep lifting it and turning it, lifting it and turning it. Now, and the, the more you use, I mean, obviously, uh, the stronger the structure. You don't want your fly to fall apart after one trout, although there are some flies that that does happen to. Mm -hmm. But it's about building a hardy fly that, that you could, you know, release a fish and then maybe catch another few maybe afterwards, and, uh, you know, for a few fish. Eventually, they will get torn apart, but, sure, you know, it happens. Exactly. So now we have our wing. Okay, tail, body, wing. The next thing we have to do is create legs. And what do we do for the legs? Well, this is called a saddle hackle. This comes from, again, a rooster. Mm -hmm. All right, and this has those tight, this is kind of the same material that we've used just from a different part than we did on the, on the uh, tail. All right, so I have one cut out already. You could see if, on this stem here, if I open it like that, you could see the barbells, yes. all right? And I separates. want, right, it separates. I, that's what's, they're stiff. That's what helps float the fly as well. And I want the length of those barbules to be about um, the same size as, say, with it, how long the tail is. Okay. Again, it's like I described earlier, it's about proportions. proportions. You know, the better your proportions, the better the fly's gonna float, and the more natural it's gonna look to the trout. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's the, uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish. So we're gonna take a little bit off. I'm going to, with my nail, I'm going to strip some off at the bottom there, like this. 
And you can see I got the bare stem. I got a little bare stem right there. In the back of that wing post, I'm going to tie in, in, like that. Okay. And now I'm going to take it and I'm going to tie it right into the post. Just like that. Okay. See that? Mm -hmm. So now the hackle is tied right into the post itself. Again, it's a step that I take to just make sure that the, 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 the fly is a little bit more hardy. Okay. Now we have to build up the thorax of the insect. And here we're going to use that synthetic dubbing that I was talking about earlier, which is very similar in the color to that turkey bia, as you can see. The body, the dubbing. So there you're not looking for much differentiation between the two. You really want them to look very much like each other. In this particular case, I do. Um, because it's what the done pattern or the adult pattern of a mayfly where um, the body is relatively close in color. Um, in a pupa, we may want to do a darker back and a lighter front. Um, so it really depends on the stage of the insect. But on this one, we want to keep it pretty close. So you can see that my dubbing, and as I put it on here, and on the thorax area is relatively close to the same color that we used on the turkey bot or the back of the fly. Okay, I'm going to use a little bit more build up. That thorax is going to be a little bit thicker than the body of the fly itself. Mm -hmm. That looks about right there. Okay, now I'm going to take the the hackle, and starting from the top, I'm going to start to wrap it around that post. See that? You mm -hmm. see how those barbels start to spread? Yes, they do. Right? And that's going to create the effect of legs. I'm not going to put too many turns in there. I think I did about five or six turns. That's okay. about it. And now I'm going to take the thread and wrap it. And yeah, because you're tying it off. Right. I'm tying it right through there. A couple of turns. I'm going to flip this around. And get it right behind the eye without trapping any of those little bobbles because I have to get my little, you know, my, my uh, line through there. Right. And so you still want to keep the eye or the hook available. That's, so you don't open, want to that's exactly right. right. So that, that worked for that uh, technique really, really well. It's by tying it through instead of bringing the hackle at the tip where uh, you got a better shot of, of covering it. Um, it's something I've been doing for about 10 years and it you know, works relatively well for this. So. I, I can guarantee that on the water, and this is a whip finishing tool. This makes the knots that fly tires use. Okay, and now it's just snipping and cleaning up the, the insect. Okay, Let's clean that up there. Again, what we're going to do is for the wing, the wing is going to be the same length as the body and the tail. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of eyeball it and cut that done wing about right there and there you have it there's your Hendrickson done okay well the pheasant yeah the pheasant tail um, soft tackle I fish it a lot when there's not much going on um, and with the pheasant tail it's easier to pull the instead of trying to cut it like this and mm -hmm. then trying to fix them I pull them sideways so they're really straight okay and then just snip it off and what you're going to do with that is you're going to start your thread <coughs> when you're not nervous and laughing and bring it back. And a lot of people say either put the wire first or put it last. I'm not really sure it matters as long as it doesn't rip anything. Uh -huh. um, sometimes I forget the wire and that's the one that the fish destroys as they take it. But so you put the tail on, and you want to measure the tail about the hook shank. Okay. And then move it back and tie it in and grab a piece of wire. It could be gold. It could be silver. It depends because you can – I use a lot of different colors. Mm -hmm. And I'll use all these. And it depends on what you're trying to copy. If you're copying nothing, just making stuff up, doesn't make no difference. Um, and you can use all different ones and change everything. So you got your, your feather on there, and then you got the wire. And you're going to bring that forward about three quarters of the way up. 
-hmm. Now what happens is when, you, when you're tying the wire on, you tie the wire forward. You can't tie the feather forward and the wire forward because then when you try to wrap the thread, it unwraps and it's not. So you want to cross, you want to do okay. one backwards and one forwards. Okay. And I find that doing the feather backwards first is easier. So you, you want to bring the feather towards you about three quarters of the way up. And you just, you have to go back and then forward towards you to lock it in. Okay. Then you want to do a couple turns because right now your thread's going the wrong way. So as you go back, you're going to lock it around it and then go back forward and cut it off. Because if you do it the other way, I find that when you wrap the wire backwards and you try to wrap the thread around it, mm -hmm. it untangles and the whole thing goes backwards. <laughs> then you, the whole thing falls apart and you get aggravated and then you go get a cup of coffee or something. But it, um, yeah, so I find if you do it the opposite way, you get a nice counter rib on there and it doesn't fall apart as easily. <laughs> but, and just make sure you use your terrible scissors. Don't use good scissors for wire because okay. they, they wreck them. And then what you do after that, because what we're tying here is this, you want some kind of dubbing to, it's going to prop up the feathers, it's going to okay. prop up the hackle. And you can use, I use a lot of squirrel dubbing because it's buggier um, than that rabbit. But the squirrel, mm -hmm. you know, you can just take the, the pelt and, and shave them down and you can mix them with something else. But depending on how you're fishing them, with the low light conditions, like I'll tie these sulfurs, I'll tie them with just the way they are, and then I'll tie them with some ice dubbing in them. And I'll fish two of those when the sun starts going down, and they'll, they always seem to take that one with the sparkle on it. So what I end up doing is I'll tie these with just, you know, just a plain mix of rabbit or, and squirrel mixed together, or just a squirrel. Mm -hmm. And something out of here, whatever color you want. Orange is always nice, and so is pink. Okay. But um, just mix them together. So multiple colors, and you're mm -hmm. looking for something to really make the, make up the body, if you will, of the ear. Yeah, just, um, and the wax depends. You can use this, but sometimes it's too much. Mm -hmm. The wax helps, use the, helps it stick to the, the thread? Yeah, it helps it stick to the thread. There's also this kind I find actually is nice, is nicer for the fuzzy stuff, um, the actual fur itself, because when you're using it with this, you don't need as much. And when you use this with the furry, anything, depending on what it is, it could be any kind of dubbing that's actual animal fur. It makes it like glue. It's like using a glue stick and it gets stuck to your hands. So I'll use this here, which is a harder wax, and just mix it on and slide it over. And then slide it up. But you don't need too much because, and you can pull it down, you can add a little extra. Because now what you have is. There's not a lot in there, but there's enough that if there's a bunch of things floating by, because the pheasant tail just imitates something. It's nothing specific, you know, it's just mm -hmm. something swimming around that something else is going to eat. So if they got a whole bunch of them swimming around, who knows which one he wants? He's going to well. be like, oh, that one looks fancy, let's take that one. Because <laughs> it's, it's, you know, they're, I, I'm guessing, I don't really know what they do, but they seem to work nice when uh, it's low light condition, from what I can tell. Um, so now we got the partridge feathers and we're gonna put that on the front kind of like for the legs so it kind of looks like they're they're swimming okay. and where you want them these here are nice for around the neck like they sell nice ones here because they get the, the small feathers around the neck for tiny flies but if you get the one with the whole head on it you can tie really small ones for okay. these because this is like a size 12 or 10 I don't remember which one I put on there um, you want somewhere around here because you got all the, the markings on the feather, okay. which make the legs look nice. And sooner, sometimes I'm tying like five or ten of them. I'll pull this out here and I'll just measure to how I want it, pluck okay. the feather, and I'll have ten feathers lined up. But what you want to do is you want you want the the uh, hackle to be a little bit longer than the hook shank, not too long because when it swims, it it'll wrap around the hook. Um, so you want a lot of them are missing because I've been using this. <laughs> I tie a lot of them. Sure. Uh, kind of cry a little bit more every time you see another feather pull off of it. So you find one that's the size you want. Some people they strip one side down. I don't really do that. Um, what you do is you you hold the feather up and you pull the end and pull this here. Okay. 
to get it down. Almost like a Christmas tree is how it looks. Okay. Like this. And you're going to snip that end off right there. Now that end, you're going to tie, you're going to pinch it. You're going to tie it right to the front. But bring your thread back to almost to where the where the dubbing is because what mm -hmm. you're going to do, everybody sees these hackle pliers and they're like, what the heck are those? They're really the greatest ones I've had because I have small hands. Mm -hmm. So there's no weird stuff and you just you, you pull them and you can spin your hand around. Um, but what you want to do is you want to keep that thread towards the towards the dubbing. Okay. And then hackle ha is going to grab the uh, feather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, I don't always strip this off because if it's a small feather, sometimes I'll leave this the fuzzy stuff on the front because it actually swims nice in the water. Um, so what you got is you can pull one side off but you don't really want to do that because then you ha it gets too bulky. So what you want to do is you put this down and you spin and plug it this way and you just spin down and around and as you're spinning you pull these back okay. so that they lay flat and you don't do that because that's not going to do it. Um, but yeah, you pull them back as they're going, and just okay. brush them a little bit. And so that to push them back. Yeah, because if not, you have feathers going front and you have feathers going back. Right. And, and then you you're gonna like a cone, almost like a yeah, cone type push of them towards the other way. If you do it the other way and you do it wrong, what happens is the feathers they go. Uh, not so much it matters. It matters to us because we're looking at our flies. The fish is probably like that thing looks all messed up. He's probably having a bad day. I'm gonna eat him. But to us, it's like, I hate it. It looks terrible. So then you want to work your thread back through it, through the, um, the hackle, and snip it off. Because this way it locks it in place. Instead of trying to put all the, um, the thread at the front, mm -hmm. you bring it back and then up through it. And then push back. And then just do a couple wraps and make sure it's how you want it. And then you're going to whip finish it. And the whip finish basically ties it off, Yeah, if you will. it keeps mm -hmm. it all in there. And you can, uh, I usually use a razor, a straight razor, I don't have one, you know the little ones in a shaver, because mm -hmm. what it does is instead of cutting it, you just, you can snip it real close, right to the, um, right to the end, and then just put a little, it's a little head cement just yep. to lock it in place if you will act as a glue. Mm -hmm. And then that's pretty much it. And these, you can fish these anyway, you can, you know, you can, you can weight them down. I like the, instead of using split shot, depending on where you're fishing, because you can't use lead, or you can use it, but you can't buy it. You can weight the line with the lead twists, or you can um, you could just put the weight right, you know, the split shot right on there. But I don't use I don't use too much weight because what I'll do is I'll fish a, a soft tackle with a bead head. Okay. I'll fish an anchor and pull it down to where you want it because you tie it up with a tag coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, no, they work. They work well. They work for a lot of things to mimic just just generic just generic bugs that are doing whatever they're doing. I better get eaten. I don't know. <laughs> that's great. But that's um, great. yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Great. Nicole, thank you. For thank your time. you. I want to thank the team at the Angler's Den for allowing us to come in and join them for their annual jamboree. I want to thank our crew for helping us all look good, and thank you for watching on the fly. I'm Lee Smith.